Good evening. My name is Father Mark Bosco, the Vice President for Mission and Ministry. Welcome to the Dahlgren Chapel of the Sacred Heart, the spiritual heart of the Georgetown community. This chapel is the physical embodiment of the deep faith and spiritual sustenance at our nation's oldest Catholic university. In this sacred space, generations of students, faculty, staff, alumni, and friends have encountered God in the sacraments, in prayer, and in communal reflection. The Jesuit tradition of education that animates the Georgetown community has always prized both the pursuit of truth and of virtue. It is the transformation of the whole person, from ignorance to understanding, from isolation to dialogue, from indifference to moral responsibility that characterizes all that we strive to do here. Tonight, the Office of Mission and Ministry, in collaboration with the Initiative of Catholic Social, on Catholic Social Thought and Public Life, continues our series, The Dahlgren Dialogues, a prayerful forum that seeks to deepen conversations about social justice in light of the rich and deep theological heritage of our Christian faith. It is our hope that a conversation in the midst of this sacred space might offer us a prayerful posture to engage the issues facing us as a church and as a nation. Framing these dialogues within a place of prayer and worship can sustain and empower us to be more active participants and renew our common sense of purpose. Tonight we share our thoughts, reflections, and prayers looking for a path forward in the clerical sexual, sexual abuse crisis in the church. We find ourselves with a heavy heart because of the failure of those in authority to protect the vulnerable. Recent events have shown how systemic the abuse and cover-up of the Catholic Church has been. Even though the 2002 Charter for the Protection of Children and Young People has gone far to address the crisis and prevent future acts of abuse, the horrific details that keep on coming up of past cover-ups remind us of the trauma experienced by many survivors of abuse and the sense of betrayal felt by all of us in the church. The sense of betrayal is strongly felt here at Georgetown. It is all the more appalling because Catholic universities like Georgetown have rightly earned a reputation as a place that cares for the vulnerable and nurtures students in their development of being both in their Christian faith and in our Ignatian values. Thus, we hope this dialogue tonight will add to our intellectual, spiritual, and communal discernment on a path forward for everyone affected by this crisis. Before I introduce the moderator of our panel and invite the panelists to take their seats, I invite us all to bow our heads in prayer. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Merciful God, you heal our wounds and strengthen us in our weakness. In your compassion, you sent your Son into the world to bear our infirmities and to endure our sufferings. May your Holy Spirit guide us toward truth and justice and ignite within us a hunger for reconciliation. Bless us with the strength and the wisdom to overcome our sinfulness and grant us the comfort of hope that rests in you alone, who live and reign forever and ever. Amen. I would now like to introduce the moderator of tonight's Dahlgren Dialogue, Mr. John Carr. As director of Georgetown's initiative on Catholic social thought and public life, John is a well-known figure here at Georgetown and in Washington, D.C., where he continues to be a leader and a convener on issues that intersect with faith and public life. Before coming to Georgetown, John served for over 20 years as director of the De Department of Justice, Peace, and Human Development at the United States Conference of Catholic Bishops. A former columnist for the Jesuit-sponsored America Magazine, John's most recent article from the October 15th issue was entitled, 
eight lessons to help us move forward from the sexual abuse crisis. All of us at Georgetown are grateful for the many events, especially in these recent weeks, that he and his staff have helped to convene to address this crisis. John and guest panelists, will you please come and take your seats in front of the chapel? Good evening. Uh, for those of you standing in the back, there are uh, seats up here on the front and in the side. Please join us. Uh, thank you, Mark, for those gracious words and for putting us in the right place and with the right tone. One of the best things that uh, our initiative has been a part of has been this new tradition of dog run dialogues, which permits us to work with our colleagues in mission and ministry to focus on uh, the moral, the religious dimensions of key public challenges in the context of prayer and reflection. Uh, last year we had three of them, one on uh, nuclear arms in North Korea, one on um, overcoming racism, a particularly powerful evening in this chapel, and one on uh, uh, the journey of immigrants. And all of those looked outward. Tonight is different. Tonight we're going to look inward at the life of the church. And not what we contribute to public life, but in some ways how our contribution is being undermined. Uh, we at the initiative, this is our third gathering, focus on this sad topic. The first was for young leaders uh, in Washington down at the School of Continuing Studies. And that, frankly, was about uh, a lot of anger and anguish from young people who had not heard about this in the same way as some of us older folks have. Second one uh, was in Gaston Hall, where we focused on the hurt and the harm of uh, clerical sexual abuse. And now we gather here in Dahlgren. And I think there are a couple things, three things that are different about this. One is the setting, and frankly, this is a, a topic that requires prayer and a lot more. Secondly, uh, we're going to focus on a path forward, not just what's been done, but uh, what can be done. And we are going to try and do that in this context of prayer and reflection. Uh, Mark talked about my uh, uh, article in America. And in that, I spoke personally that how this uh, evil had affected me personally, professionally, and uh, institutionally, and how it had uh, haunted me in some ways for 50 years. First in a high school seminary, then my service at a local archdiocese and then my work at the Bishop's Conference. What I take out of these two discussions and what we've been talking about together are three, three ideas that I'm going to try and get our conversation to focus on. One is power. Whatever else this was, this was an abuse of power. And we have to examine uh, what was done, who did it, and what are the consequences. A second is silence, and I spoke personally about the silence that I had kept about my own experience, and this is the third time we're gonna try and break the silence, and we've got a remarkable panel to do that. And then thirdly is the, the idea of lay leadership, that we are the church, and that we have responsibilities uh, to step up. And we have a remarkable group of leaders to help us do that. Uh, let me begin with Father Jerry, F Father Jerry McGlone. Uh, Jerry, you, are, uh, you bring unique perspectives to this. You're a priest, you're a Jesuit, you're a psychologist, uh, you have served at a treatment center, you have uh, 
You have taught, you've served in a parish. Uh, you now serve uh, the major superiors of, with religious communities, and you've worked in a seminary. You have been a victim of sexual abuse, you have treated abusers, and you have cared for those who shared in that abuse. Help us understand, what are we talking about? What are the dimensions of this? What, who are the victims, the abusers? What, how has our church failed to understand this, respond to it, and in fact, on, on the contrary, not only tolerated it, but enabled it. Given your unique perspectives, help us go more deeply into this terrible challenge we face as a community of faith. Well, first of all, John, thank you for inviting me to be part of this, and I feel honored to be uh, with all of you here. Uh, I, um, <clears throat> sorry, you just stirred up a lot of uh, memories. I uh, speak to you really as a survivor and of both child abuse by a Jesuit, and uh, that same Jesuit um, then became my formator and continued that abuse throughout my early formation. Um, I stand with other survivors for you to know about our resilience. I sit here that you understand that we look and we act just like you and our faces and our bodies are just like yours. Um, so why do, uh, and so the pain of this moment is very palatable to me and to you, and we've talked at length about our stories. I think the first aspect to this is understanding who was victimized is central. Because my point, if you, if you leave this room with one major point, what we have never gotten right in this crisis from 1992, 2002, and now currently, is to have a survivor's perspective. That's the bottom line. If a bishop or major superior thought and felt the pain that we have endured, they would never have done what they have done. First key point. The second key point is when you look at the types and the various dimensions of who survives sexual abuse, it's because, like in my own experience, and I don't say this to, to, to solicit any pity, just that I was sixth of eight kids. So my dad was working three jobs. So I was vulnerable because I needed an adult figure. And perpetrators are absolutely astute at going after the vulnerable. They have the sixth sense that's part of their pathology where they can pick up you know, those sorts of things and then you become you know, uh, absolutely enamored because this person is acting like that which you need. It's a very insidious disease. Uh, who are the other you know, survivors? What are they typically like? They're, they're people who have worked and have had significant relationships with these men. This didn't happen overnight. They were artful groomers, and they were pathological in how well they groomed. The other key thing is that we see, you know, with survivors, this amazing ability to respond and to absolutely be obedient because that's what the perpetrator plays upon. The very relationship that they've built up over time, that trust, that power, is what they use against victims. And so it's because victims trusted. They had confidence in that. And the perpetrators existed in a system that allowed that. And that's the other key point. If we're to look at a path going forward, we have to look at cultural systemic change. Enough of the policies, enough of the criminal approach, enough of another report, we have to have significant cultural change and monitor that change and its effectiveness. I'm a clinical researcher, so I like outcomes. I want to see something produced that is long term. And that's what we need right now, because the perpetrators, as, as, as you know, you asked the question, so who are the perpetrators? 
you know, the tiny percentage, 2%, were actual pedophiles. But they account for 40% of the victims. You know, the rest are really what we call situational offenders. And there's the hope that if we can somehow change those situations, we decrease the opportunity, therefore we have great prevention tools. But much more than that, it's a lifestyle that we have to change. The reform has to be utterly grounded in a relational accountability that does not exist in rectories and certainly does not exist in any community I live in. And that is my deepest fear now, that we still have systems that lack a relational accountability and we live like bachelors in a really nice Four Seasons hotel. And uh, Father Jerry talked about uh, culture. You have, uh, were asked to take a look at this clerical culture, this Episcopal culture. Uh, you're a justice of the Illinois Supreme Court. Uh, you're married to an alderman. For those of you not oh, from he's Chicago. To me, John. Hmm? He's married to me. Yeah. Well, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I stand corrected, Your Honor. Uh, uh, for those of you not from Chicago, an alderman's a big deal, and he has been an alderman for 50 years. Uh, and uh, graduated from Maria High School. Did. Uh, started to raise a family, and then went back to school. And then went to law school. And particularly focused on persons with disabilities in her practice and in her, in her service. She helped Uni Shriver uh, bring Special Olympics to Chicago and move it nationally. And then uh, she joined public service, became a justice of the Supreme Court, which I assume is a difficult job, but then because uh, you had not suffered enough in your life, <laughs> Uh, you were asked to serve on the National Review Board mm -hmm. of the United States Conference of Catholic Bishops, which is where I saw Anne for the first time, her leadership, as she and her colleagues tried to help the church understand and address the culture that Jerry described. Can you tell us what, what you learned about the dimensions of this, uh, the consequences of this, and what was done and what was not done? And how do we find ourselves in this situation 15 years after your review board uh, made such an important contribution? Well, John, thanks very much for including me uh, this evening. It's what a panel in front of all of you. Um, I think most importantly is that you're here and listening to the conversation because that's what we need to do as lay people. Um, have more conversations everywhere we go, everyone we talk to, because that will help change the culture. Um, I personally am um, not as optimistic as you, Father McGlone, um, because I've seen what the bishops have um, intentionally done. When uh, Boston uh, erupted, they intentionally, the bishops intentionally met and decided to have a lay review board and put a charter together. The charter started out with us investigating clerics, but they changed the word from cleric to priests. So we originally could have investigated the bishops, but they took it out and then voted. So that was an intentional piece right there. And we did investigate the entire United States. Kathleen McChesney did an outstanding job, went to every diocese and eparchy and asked for the, the, the files from the diocese. Uh, we had to um, be at the bishop's behest of which files they gave us. We had heard there were secret, confidential, or discretionary files in every diocese. Um, but we didn't, weren't given that. But we did come up with the exact same statistics, Father, uh, that you had disclosed, a very, very low percentage of pedophilia, more eubophilia, and um, an opportunity. And a young associate not knowing his own sexuality, being in a situation, 
on a vulnerable male or female, but most of it was male. And it was, homo was not homosexuality, it was homosexual conduct, but not homosexuality. So we had our report, we investigated, and we gave recommendations to the bishops, and we've been waiting in the 15 years for what happened, because there is no accountability. There is no one in charge overseeing if they're following the charter. And as we're seeing now, as of this week, 15 dioceses in the United States have received subpoenas to turn over their files for the civil authorities. Um, I expect some other ones in the next few weeks to be turning over their files to the civil authorities because we have lost trust. We don't know how many more offenders there have been because they have not been posted on websites and those secret files, that's what came, up, came out in uh, Philadelphia, the files that were not posted originally. Going forward, I do think um, an independent lay board has to oversee um, the bishops in a total ecclesiastical clerical change. Um, there is no question about it. And the only way that will be done is if you, as lay Catholics, insist on it. You have to demand that every parish has lay people involved. You have to demand that every diocese, you're there and you're going to help. Otherwise, it won't change. It's the power that you described, Father Jerry, that will never change unless we demand it of our church and our um, superiors, so to speak. But I have to say this, is that I can't say right now one bishop or one cardinal that I actually can look at and not wonder. Have you transferred somebody in the past? Have you known about uh, Cardinal McCarrick? Have you known about Wuerl or Sean O'Malley or Gomez or DiNardo in, in transferring priests? and who are abusers, I can't honestly say I know one cardinal or bishop that I can actually say I know they didn't know. And so going forward, I hope all of us can work together as lay Catholics because this is our church. I'm not going to let them get the best of me and give up my faith. My faith is far greater. In fact, I'm more emboldened now with my faith than I was as a passive Catholic sitting in the pews before all this scandal started. I will not let the, the hierarchy ruin our church and my own faith. So that's where I'm coming from. And the only way I can do it is by talking and coming here and having you talk. Listening sessions in every parish, listening sessions. There's a, um, a wonderful non-for-profit organization in Chicago, Chicago Community Trust. Every year, they have tables, uh, dinner at, uh, and round, sitting around tables throughout the city. Thousands of people invite people to a coffee shop or their own home to have a topic that they talk about as, as a listening session, and they do something about it that year. I think all of us in the Catholic Church this coming year have to have roundtable discussions in our homes and talk about what needs to be done and come up with a plan, because I don't know what the plan could be. Well, Carrie's going to give us She's that She's going to give us a plan. <laughs> Good, Carrie. But before that, <laughs> yes. uh, we're going to turn to Erica Lizza, who is a senior in the School of Foreign Service. These folks have been dealing with this for decades. You come to this with fresh eyes, I'm sorry to say. Uh, Erica is the uh, president of the Catholic Women at Georgetown. Uh, she is also uh, deeply involved in the Cardinal O'Connor Conference, which if you're not familiar with, is one of the most remarkable student-led efforts around the March for Life. Uh, bringing young leaders from across the country to Georgetown to talk about how we defend human life and dignity. Uh, she comes from the Midwest, so she's part of the Sanity Caucus in our church. Uh, and uh, she has been a student who has taken leadership in challenging this university to face up to this challenge. You might have read her comments in the Washington Post or the Hoya. In addition to making the case, in addition to uh, uh, the petition and the meetings with the leadership of the university, 
She and her Catholic student leaders have had a Eucharistic holy hour uh, to pray for our church at, at our time of need. So Erica, you bring, as I said, fresh eyes uh, as a student, as a young woman, as a Catholic at Georgetown, as a Catholic leader. What has learning about this done to your faith? What has it done to uh, how you think our church is perceived, not only by you and your friends, uh, but also by others here at Georgetown? And what do you expect of our church in the face of this challenge? Small questions. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks so much for having me, Dr. Carr. Um, yeah, so I'm, so I'm 21 years old, so I was not even born when everything happened in 1992. That's some of you guys have mentioned. I was in kindergarten um, when the 2002 case broke open. So these are not things I really have many memories of, although I went to a Catholic grade school and periodically I remember things kind of um, being mentioned about the sexual abuse crisis just in my community. Um, we actually had a very wonderful charismatic pastor, um, the man who administered my first communion, who was um, later transferred from our parish and then two years later removed from active ministry um, because of sexual misconduct that had occurred back in 1979 um, with a teenage girl. Um, and so that was something that there is a lot of secrecy about, a lot of, um, I think, probably shame on the part of our community who hadn't known this or had known this and hadn't um, kept him away from you know, a place where he could potentially find other victims. Um, and it was something that, that wasn't really talked about out loud. Um, it wasn't until well after I graduated um, the elementary school, it was elementary middle school. So it wasn't until well after that um, actually until I was a freshman in Georgetown that I found some articles in my local newspaper and was able to kind of put the pieces together. Um, and so then it kind of just made, made more sense why his departure had been kind of odd and, and everything that had, had gone on like that. Um, so I, while I don't have the, the personal experience, you have Dr. Carr or you, Father McGlone, um, this is something that has, has kind of resonated with him, kind of what I would call like my Catholic cradle, the place where I would grew up Catholic as the parish my parents still attend. So that was um, pretty formative. Um, yeah, I think I, I speak as a young person. Um, our generation in general is not, not very predisposed uh, to bureaucratic hierarchical institutions and how they sometimes lack transparency. We're a generation that wants change and we want it now. Um, sometimes it manifests itself in, I think, some less sophisticated communication and maybe unreasonable demands, but I think what you're seeing from young Catholics right now is really the same thing that I've seen from all of you, which is anger, frustration, disgust, disappointment, and a desire for learning the authentic truth, which I think we all feel has been really um, delayed or misconstrued or deliberately manipulated over the past decade or so. Um, so I think the number one thing young Catholics want is truth. And I think once they have that truth, they'll decide how to act on it. I know for people who have already been struggling with their faith or maybe don't relate to the church, um, maybe still maintain elements of their faith but aren't a, a regular mass attendee or, or have disagreements with the church on various issues, um, this is probably the proverbial straw that breaks the camel's back. Um, I know I have a lot of friends and relatives back home who are kind of the occasional Catholics um, who go on Christmas and Easter because they're home and mom and dad are gonna make them. Um, and with a church in, in, in the shape that it is like this, um, I don't see a whole lot of hope for them coming back, quite frankly. Um, here at Georgetown, as Dr. Carr mentioned, I've been involved in, in some student responses to the crisis. So as, as president of Catholic Women at Georgetown, something we um, really prioritized was making sure our members knew about this situation that had unfolded over the summer. We had members who were traveling abroad or from various parts of the country. And um, if you were in Pennsylvania or DC, you definitely knew. And it was getting on national news and stuff, but we wanted to make sure everyone was on the same page. We wanted to make sure everyone was knowledgeable about what had happened so far and about what would likely come out within the upcoming months. Um, so that was something I communicated to my members in a few emails, and we set aside some special times, as Dr. Carr mentioned. Um, we hosted a Eucharistic holy hour, praying for the victims of um, clerical sex abuse. Um, we co-hosted that with the Knights of Columbus chapter here at Georgetown, and we also co-hosted um, a spiritual discussion dinner where this was the topic on how to move forward as a church. 
Um, when it comes to other things um, here at Georgetown, um, something I have been involved in is a petition to revoke the honorary degrees granted to Cardinals McCarrick and Wuerl, um, both who are former archbishops of the Archdiocese of Washington, D.C., um, and both who had longstanding connections to Georgetown, both were frequent um, celebrants of masses here. They gave lectures, they attended events, hosted by a variety of departments and organizations. Um, and they're really part of the Catholic community here at Georgetown, and I would say even just the larger Georgetown community. Um, in a lot of ways, they really epitomized what Georgetown is all about, interreligious and interfaith engagement, um, concern for social justice and human life and dignity. So many of these important things that we pride ourselves on as a university community. Um, and so I think it really is jarring for a lot of us to realize that people who we did hold close in our community um, betrayed our trust and our values by either abusing um, vulnerable people as McCarrick did or by letting that abuse go unchecked and in some places um, just tacitly allowed to continue mm -hmm. as Cardinal World did. Um, so. so yeah. Uh, you said uh, young people want change and they want it now. Uh, you're taking on Georgetown and you're taking on the Roman Catholic Church. Uh, we're known for a lot of things, but change and change now are not two of the things. But uh, my sense is change is coming. As you know, uh, the pre president's office has announced that there's a review of honorary degrees. Uh, and uh, particularly as it applies to uh, Cardinal McCarrick and Cardinal Wuerl, both of whom have been involved, are friends of mine, and have been involved in this initiative. And uh, our hope is that will move forward. On the subject of honorary degrees, I just want to correct the record. You called me Dr. Carr. I, I don't have an earned doctorate. Um, and I do have a couple honorary degrees, but the only one who's allowed to call me Dr. Carr is my wife. Uh, uh, and only on special days. Uh, so uh, I'm happy to be a layperson just like you uh, at Georgetown trying to make sure we make the right choices. And I thank you for your leadership and your witness. Carrie has been a friend since we were, Carrie Robinson has been a friend since we worked together at the Bishop's Conference. She has done a lot of remarkable things, including graduating from this university. I think you probably spent some time in these walls. The, uh, she has been a remarkable leader on something we talk about a lot, which is lay leadership. She was the founding director or founder of the Leadership Roundtable, which brought lay leaders together to try and figure out how uh, they could help the church adopt best practices, confront challenges in terms of management, finances, human resources. I would think clerical sexual abuse uh, includes management, human resources, finances. You, other people talk a lot about, you've written a wonderful book about how to raise money. I'm trying to learn that skill. <laughs> um, but. Lots of us have been sort of wrestling around about how we get lay leadership in dealing with the failures of the hierarchical leadership that we've talked about tonight. What in your experience, your work, you just came from a meeting of lay leaders, what are the paths, what are the directions we can take to deal with uh, this thing that is breaking our church? Well, I'm also honored to be here with all of you and back at Dahlgren, responding to this crisis and advocating for the role of lay leadership and frankly, particularly women in the church has been a central component of my work on behalf of the church all of my adult life. I first became aware of the sexual abuse crisis in 1987 when I was 20 years old as a senior here at Georgetown at this wonderful university. At the time, I had been recently elected to the board of trustees of our family foundation, the Raskob Foundation for Catholic Activities. And before us was a half million dollar request from the Archdiocese of Santa Fe asking us to help uh, settle lawsuits and provide counseling for victims. 
I was absolutely and utterly appalled. And whether you have the vantage point back in 1987 or today, I was either desperately naive or prescient. I wanted to deny the grant. I thought our responsibility as a Catholic lay family was to help the archbishop reveal, make clear, open to the sunlight everything that he was um, dealing with at that time. Uh, just briefly, there was a, a, a treatment center in Santa Fe, so bishops were sending troubled priests to this treatment center, and consequently, Santa Fe um, experienced their, a, a lion's share of of uh, abuse after they were treated and released and stayed in Santa Fe. So I thought that the right thing to do was to help the archbishop be very candid and bring this to light, to stop the silence, even unwitting silence, mm. and um, to help him sell church property and if need be, sell church property in order that the victims would have recompense and have counseling that was the just and right thing uh, to do. And if necessary, I proudly said to my relatives, we can have mass in the field. Well, they thought I was naive. Um, fast forward, it is 2002, and I'm working with one of the world's greatest priests, a diocesan priest, Father Bob Boulogne, the Catholic chaplain at Yale University who just died in September. He and I uh, worked together on a $75 million successful capital campaign to expand Catholic life at another great world-class universe, world university, uh, Yale. And halfway through that campaign in 2002, the Boston Globe, uh, of course, began to share with the world uh, the sexual abuse crisis, and those revelations were devastating to the Yale students that we were ministering to. Many people at the time said, Carrie, Father Bob, you didn't cause it. We're not responsible for this. Don't worry about it. Just keep raising money. Keep advancing the ministry at Yale. Father Bob and I felt that, again, this kind of moral determination that the right thing to do was to respond to students' questions and to be, to the extent that we regard it ourselves as belonging to this faith family, there was a moral obligation to be part of the solution. To do nothing is to be complicit. So we, um, with the help of our board, planned a three-day conference in 2003 called Governance, Accountability, and the Future of the Catholic Church. It was an incredibly gutsy thing to do. 500 people came. There were 30 nationally acclaimed speakers. We published the proceedings, uh, and that became a kind of touchstone for the reform movement ever since. Three months later, I met Jeff Wazi, the founder of Leadership Roundtable. He had come to very similar conclusions in all of his research. Uh, he, he desperately wanted to bring the resources at his disposal well beyond money, even though he was a prominent Catholic philanthropist and a kind of world-class financial leader, the former chair of the board of Boston College. He wanted to bring intellectual resources and social capital together, harnessing the expertise of lay leaders from all walks of life, working in concert with the ordained and religious at a very high level to restore trust in the church and to change the culture, frankly, back then um, about the way the church manages people, facilities, and finances. It was completely predicated on uh, introducing uh, contemporary best managerial practices that are predicated on accountability and transparency. Now here we are in 2018. It is a devastating deja vu of demoralization, to, frankly. Today I serve as global ambassador of Leadership Roundtable, bringing these practices and resources that have 
helped the Catholic Church in the US to the global Catholic Church, and particularly in Rome, which is connected to all of this. Sadly and heartbreakingly, this is not a unique uh, problem for the church in the US. It is everywhere that the church is, and we're gonna be learning more about that. So at Leadership Roundtable, we look at this today as twin crises, sexual abuse of children and vulnerable adults and a crisis of distrust of church leadership. Solving one without the other is not helpful. They have to be addressed in tandem. Catholics believe that bishops have not been held accountable for their action and inaction, leading to the protection of the institutional church at the expense of the most vulnerable members of our community, children. So what have we done at Leadership Roundtable since the Pennsylvania report and the McCarrick revelations to respond to these twin crises and to restore trust? First, we formed an ad hoc crisis committee of members of our board and staff. We have, the, these are ordained religious and lay, but predominantly uh, senior level lay executives with vast experience and competencies. Uh, we, we meet every week to discuss this. We've engaged the viewpoints of many people and networks. We regard ourselves as a network of networks. This is no time for competition. It is the time for collaboration. Um, we've drafted op-eds and articles, a white paper, and the beginning of a very detailed blueprint way forward. Um, we don't pretend to have all the answers. We are asking for input to perfect this. We look at it as a living document, but at least it's a plan, and it's an important one. This morning, as John said, I flew in from Minneapolis where 30 lay experts, bishops, a cardinal, canon lawyers, survivors, and scholars met to put forward concrete recommendations for action, all of which are predicated on lay leadership and co-responsibility, structural changes that allow for accountability and transparency, and these many discussions and analysis, um, including those from yesterday, help inform this blueprint. So uh, it addresses the twin crises, it calls for independent reviews, care and justice for survivors, and what we refer to as transformative cultural and structural changes in management and governance. So, and I can get into some of those in our discussion, some concrete uh, examples of what we're advocating. That's terrific and encouraging. Uh, we have about 15 minutes before we're going to turn to questions and we're going to ask students to uh, have the opportunity to ask the first questions. So students, be ready. Uh, <laughs> Let's focus where we left off on the future. Each of us in our own way has talked about what we've experienced and what we have done. And talked about more clearly what should be done, Carrie did as well. If, if we take the two things that have been consistent in our reflections, one is a culture which needs to change and the other is that lay people need to be at the center of that cultural change. What are the opportunities? What are the challenges? What are the paths forward in this regard? Father, can you begin? Um, first of all, thank you. Uh, and you give me great hope. And I'm not that optimistic. <laughs> <laughs> uh, thanks a lot. <laughs> no, I'm really not, because I, I know who I'm working with, and I, I, know, who, I know these men. Uh, it's the good old boys club, so I mean, that's the first problem. Um, by the way, uh, the judge and I are, must be cousins because her, her maiden name is McGlone too, so. You know, right. <laughs> you know what, troublemaker. I know, I know. <laughs> the and Irish that's, always. And that's, uh, and Can I invite, just Father, there are lots of people standing in the back and we've got about another uh, 45 minutes. There are chairs up here, unless you're just Catholics and more comfortable in the back. <laughs> but uh, please join us up front. Uh, I don't, want to, I don't want to induce fear, though, because I, I know it's a fear response for Catholics to move forward. Um, I agree with you on, on every, everything you've said, and thank you for your witness here uh, on, on campus. That's what we need, and I'm depending on you 
and I'm depending on, on the women's voice to be heard. That's first and foremost. There would never have been this crisis had there been mothers and fathers at the table. And that's the first part of the solution. Les Worsi lives with me. He's, he was a uh, Peretti, Peretti at, uh, at the Vatican Council. And he has a great chapter that I could certainly send you, John, in his book. Essentially, it is our tradition, by the way, that only got subverted right after Vatican II, in which lay men and women were part and parcel of church organization. So let's be traditional. <laughs> Let's go back to the roots of lay <laughs> empowerment, first and foremost. There are certain canons that need to be changed today. Mm -hmm. And the Pope, as the representative of the magisterium, can change them tomorrow. They need to be changed. That's the path forward. You can't possibly, in a hierarchical institution, have change that doesn't come from the top. One of the key images I want to invite you into, and, and Les has really taught me a lot about this, is the people of God and the hierarchy make up the church. And for the past 50, 60 years, post-Vatican II, it's been top-heavy in the sense that the power of lay men and women has been literally undercut beneath you and you never knew it was happening because it all looks so nice, doesn't it? But you're not decision makers with power. And that's what I clearly see as a path forward in that regard. And concurring with you, what's the path forward? The path forward is having structures change that are research-based, evidence-based. You know, in other words, that a cultural process change has to occur, but it must be held accountable. What are the measures? You know, what are the particular variables you want to see change and measure it? Okay. Hold Erica, them accountable. let's break up the pattern here. Uh, you talked about uh, change, change now. What are some steps? And you talked about the need for this university to confront who it had given honorary degrees and places of honor to. What else would you like to see f from this institution as you play a particular role on this campus as a leader, not only an individual Catholic, but a leader of Catholic women at Georgetown? So I think the, the revocation of honorary degrees is a good start. I think what I'd like to see accompany that is something that the church as a whole can use, which is really just kind of an extended examination of conscience, um, which is a, a tough reckoning of what are the ways in which we have been complicit in maybe not the abuse, but maybe simply ignoring that abuse occurs, um, the deliberate covering up of such abuse, if that's the scenario, what are the ways in which we reinforce the notion that, as Father McGloom was mentioning, that church leadership and decision making solely rests within the hierarchy. Um, so I think that's something that it would be good for Georgetown as well as other Catholic universities, parishes, um, lay institutions, et cetera, to look at. Um, I think it is important to get women's voices involved. Uh, I don't want to treat this as, as if this is solely a women's issue. Um, I take issues with that term, by the way. I don't think there is such a thing as only a women's issue. but. Um, you know, most of the victims of this scenario have been um, boys and men, um, but I do think it's very important to have women involved in the conversation. As Father McGlone mentioned, especially mothers and fathers as well are going to look at this with a very different perspective than clergy are. Um, I think women in general are much more likely to be victims of sexual assault and harassment than men are. That's just a fact. So if you have women's voices in the room when we're talking about how to address sexual violence, which child sexual abuse is certainly another aspect of sexual violence, um, I think we can probably come up with some better practices and ways to address this. Um, I think overall it does have to be a cultural change. Um, as Anne was saying, you know, get involved at your local church. I know here at Georgetown we're fortunate we have so many students who are very involved in Catholic ministry, um, whether it's the liturgical aspects, the community aspects, um, dialogues like this one. Um, but I think it's really important that Lay, lay leaders are involved at the level of their local parishes, in their dioceses. Um, don't be afraid to be a troublemaker. If you see something and you, it doesn't seem right to you, or you're wondering why this priest has been transferred around or anything, if there's things going on in your diocese that don't seem right, ask questions. Learn more about the procedures. If you think there's something that needs to be addressed, do not be afraid to speak up. Well, 
And clearly you are following your own advice. Uh, and we're glad you do. And you talked about uh, the failed culture you encountered. And you appealed for lay leadership to take that on. Do you have any additional, more specific ideas how we can do that? Well, I, I think that um, we're still waiting for more dioceses around the country to be given subpoenas. Um, and that's going to continue on until I think most of the dioceses in the United States either get a subpoena or, or would stand up. I would suggest that I, I, I would ask the bishops and the cardinals to come forward with the files and present the files. Go, be first. Wait, don't wait, sit back for the subpoena because we're all sitting there like this waiting. What's going to happen next and what are we going to find out? Well, turn the files over. Let them look at it, let them see it, and come clean. Because I think it's like substance abuse or alcoholism or whatever until you hit rock bottom and we know everything that's going on, we can't heal. There's no way to, for us to heal until we know what the whole story is. The, the files that, that come clean would show that there is a pattern of cover-up and intentional conduct not to send a lot of the priests to the lay review board, and then the lay review board is reviewed by the bishop, and the bishop makes a decision on whether or not that priest should go to some health care facility in New Mexico, or where Father Jerry is, or whatever, and, and, and then they can come back. I mean, these are in documents that if they, if, we, if they ever saw the light of day, would show that when the priest finished his three weeks away for his three weeks of therapy, is going to be transferred to another parish. And that's recently in a diocese, right now, 2017. This isn't 50 years ago. It's still happening. So the culture is continuing. I cannot emphasize more that the bishops themselves and the cardinals have to come forward and say, yes, I transferred priests, I did it, I really didn't know what I was doing or I did it, but let people know and admit things. We are always having to go to confession and admit things and admit things to each other, right? I think they have to too. I mean, we can't trust them unless we know we can go forward. And there's no reason why lay people can't decide what the what the process is in every diocese, because that's what it is now. The dioceses are all independent. They, um, the United States Conference of Catholic Bishops, I liken it to a trade association. So each bishop and each eparchy uh, goes to those to the bishops' conference. They come together, they decide what they're going to do, and they go home and do what they want to do. But until the lay people are involved and know what the procedures are and what the rules are. I don't know what we can do. We have to make sure we draft those procedures. And okay. I think, uh, Carrie, that's exactly what we need to do. But getting into that system is impossible. Right now, we, our former board wrote a letter to the Bishop's Conference, uh, to Cardinal N N uh, DiNardo, saying we would reconstitute ourselves and come and help you do this. Well, we did get an email saying thank you for your letter. And then finally we got a letter just last week saying thank you very much. They haven't done anything since July. So now they're going to meet again in November and pray. Then they're going to have a, a little retreat in February before they go to Rome to discuss this. Why can't we do something now? Why can't they stand up and do something now? Just like you said. I agree with you. Yep. If we were to do some of those kinds of things, these, first of all, these kinds of crimes know no borders. This is part of humanity. We've got schools and parks and all kinds of things that have um, problems with this issue. It attracts people who are going to um, prey on children. But how you deal with it is determinative. The civil authorities now are the only ones who can make these bishops come clean, I think. And that's a terrible thing to say. But I, I don't see how we can trust it. Yeah. Erica talked about an examination of conscience. You talked about going to confession. I've been talking to a lot of journalists. And they said, you know, I was talking about review boards and lay this and lay that. And they said, well, what do you think? I mean, come on. And I said, they expect us to keep our vows. They ought to keep theirs. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
I will do anything in the world to protect my children. They ought to do anything in the world to protect our children. That's not too much to ask. Uh, Carrie, you're the global ambassador of the Leadership Roundtable. You talked about uh, some of the steps you're taking in this country, but you carry this message to Rome, uh, to the Vatican, and as Father said, and as others have said, uh, Pope Francis and the Vatican need to take some steps. What is your experience in trying to communicate the anger and the anguish and the urgency uh, that we've heard? Well, so the first thing that I want to say, and it, it echoes how you started, every discussion that we have, every deliberation and plan put forward has to have survivors as part of it centrally. Uh, I think this, what this does is it reminds us that we are called to be preferentially careful of the most vulnerable in our, in our midst and that our decisions have to be informed by the survivor's witness and experience and, and input, uh, whether that's here or in Rome. And I, it, it is no accident that after Pope Francis met with the survivors in Chile, for example, mm -hmm that all of the bishops then tendered their resignation. There's a direct, it's a conversion of heart and mind that happens. And one of the things we would advocate is that every bishop and cardinal and priest listen and meet with survivors. Uh, that really leads to this conversion. So a, a couple of other uh, uh, proposals that we have, some of these are, are bold, but this is a time to be bold. Uh, and some of these were voiced yesterday in, in this gathering. Others have been, uh, these are not novel, but they're worth sharing with you. One idea is to conduct a thorough review of clericalism embedded in the code of canon law and commit to making changes tomorrow, <laughs> you know, as, as you we said. Did not Sure, no. <laughs> um, another suggestion, supplement the John Jay study, which after 2002 examined the causes and context of the sexual abuse crisis, supplement that with a study that examines the misuse and abuse of power among church leaders, particularly in light of the crisis. Again, we didn't confer, but... Um, that was part, Carrie, that was part of the report is 15 years ago is to look just at that topic. At power. And they didn't do it. Right. So we're, we're calling for it to be done now. Mm -hmm. um, review and overhaul the manner in which bishops are selected, assigned, and elevated. Why not have women serving on the congregation of bishops? Why not? We, we, have, we should be ashamed as, of ourselves as a church for underutilizing women at every level of leadership and decision making. It is a, that is a, a terrible example of, of stewardship. And uh, we do go over to Rome about twice a year for 11 years, spanning three popes, talking to the prefects and presidents of the pontifical congregations and councils, so the, the inner circle to the pope, the, the cardinals, who run these dicasteries. And we talk about the importance of elevating women to meaningful positions of leadership and insisting that they are at the tables of decision making, not just for women for women's sake, it's, it's women with men, diversity matters, the diverse perspectives and experiences that we bring collectively lead to better outcomes. And uh, I think women's role in all of this going forward is essential. Um, Jerry? If, if I may, one of the, the, to piggyback on my cousin's remark, yeah. that um, <laughs> one of the things that CMSM has been, uh, shall we say, aggressively persuaded to try to do is that we will be coming out with a major announcement in regards to all the 17,000 priests and brothers in the United States that we will be releasing a statement basically encouraging them to release all the names. And so to me, this is a dream come true. Uh, but again, I want to echo that. Why are you not having independent file reviews on a regular basis 
before the state comes in and does it anyway. Why can't we be more proactive? Why can't we do something now? Is, I just want to reiterate what you're saying, Judd, because it, I, it's so critical. I have lots more questions, but I think it's time to turn particularly to students. Kim and John are there with mics. If you'd come forward, if students would raise their hand. And while you're trying to find them, uh, the, there's one here, I see. Uh, the, uh, Jerry said there need to be more parents, more women, more mothers and dads in the room when these decisions are made, and that's the point I've learned from my own experience. One of the things that I think connects is not just on review boards, mm -hmm. not just on finance council, priest personnel boards, Amen. the way bishops are nominated, the way people are moved. We need more folks involved with a variety of experience at every level of the yeah. church's and life. And they need to have authority. Yeah. I mean, let's stop the BS. You know, give them authority over finances. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Amen. Yeah. Okay, uh, here we go. <laughs> Who's got a question? Stand up, identify yourself. Hi, uh, my name is Burby. I'm a senior here at Georgetown. And my question is, how do we create an environment where survivors of abuse uh, feel empowered to report their abusers and know that like reporting them won't like lead to their like reports being like swept under the rug? Okay. Jerry, you deal with this and you've dealt with this? We're gonna answer this question and then we'll come Okay, well, let's try and answer, and then we'll come to you. Bring the mic forward. Yeah. Okay. No. Okay. Judge, did you want to answer that first? Well, I, what I see that's um, lacking, um, even though every uh, state has different mandated reporters, one of the, the, the last things that a board does is call the civil authorities. I mean, we're talking about criminal conduct, um, whether it be you know a battery or an assault or whatever it is. This is criminal conduct. They have to be called, and they're not called. And, and, and maybe they may never be called in some of these cases. But some bishops are not, um, and some priests are not mandated reporters. That might have to by, go by state by state. But I think it should be something done voluntarily anyway. And then the, um, the lay review board and people can start looking at things internally. But you have to call the civil authorities when there's criminal mm -hmm. conduct. Jerry, well, isn't I, this yeah. the practice? Yeah, no, no and see, I, I think what I'm hearing in the question is something a bit different in the sense of how do we create a transparency and a safety at the same time that allows any of our, us who are survivors to come forward. And I think that's where we need to create cultures that are transparent, where we talk about it on a more regular basis, like what you're doing, and congratulations, but also that we have trained faculty and staff who also know how to manage that. You know, because you never know if it's a janitor who might have you know, someone come to them because they're cleaning the room you know, in, the, in, the, in the dormitory. And, and so again, what are we talking about? A system of support that is ready to really accompany, as Francis would say, those who are, survivor, who are survivors, so that that sort of availability creates trust. Okay. And that's what we need. Back there, student. Stand up. Hi, my name is Ryan. I'm a junior here at Georgetown. So Catholic University and Fordham have already revoked uh, the honorary degrees given to McCarrick. Villanova recently uh, released a letter to the USCCB uh, proposing some uh, changes to consider at their meeting in November. Uh, we're here at Georgetown, one of the most prestigious, if not the most prestigious, prestigious Catholic Jesuit universities in the nation. What is Georgetown's role in this fight? Well, uh, here's what I know. Uh, we're a little piece of Georgetown. Uh, this is our third effort to address this. Uh, it's been serious. We're not a part of the silence, and we're trying to raise this. It's my understanding that students, and you can talk about this, have met with the leadership of the university on several occasions. And as a result of that, the board has established a committee or a working group, I guess, is what it's called. There are all sorts of official distinctions 
to review not only the question of the degrees for Cardinal McCarrick or ex-Cardinal McCarrick and Cardinal World, but the larger practice of honorary degrees. And I think there are other things. Uh, there's going to be uh, a service of repentance here. There's going to be a dialogue with Father Jerry. I think there is programming, and then the governance of the university is discerning, uh, to use a very Jesuit word, on what the best way forward is. Do you want to add to that? Sure, I'll just add a little bit to that. So I think the revocation of degrees is a big step. Um, obviously, we're Georgetown, we like to take things slow. We're a large university, lots of bureaucracy. That's just kind of how we operate, as you pointed out. Bureaucracy isn't our word. We're, we discern. <laughs> <laughs> we discern. Um, what, I, what I would say, though, is I think um, this progress has been, yes, I, to answer your question, yes, I have met with um, representatives from the president's office, as have a number of other students, um, and this working group is a part of the Board of Governors, was recently convened within the past two weeks and will be meeting shortly. Can I, can um, I address that? No, go ahead. And I am hopeful that they will come to what I view as the, a very simple, correct decision um, as to why this hasn't been kind of green-lighted or moving faster. I think um, it's probably the same old culture of thinking that, you know, if we just ignore it, it'll go away. <laughs> I think we have a track record as a church of, of looking at these issues like that, whether it was in the 60s and 70s, whether it was in 1992, whether it was in 2002, whether it's Chile, whether it's Ireland, whether it's anywhere in the United States. Um, sadly, that's been kind of the modus operandi of our church, and I think um, this may just be another example of that. Okay, Jerry? Yeah, it, being from the outside, I, I'm not a faculty member here at Georgetown, but I live with a lot of faculty members. And, and, and I have to say I've been both disappointed and frustrated with Jesuit leadership in this regard, quite frankly. I find it appalling that the Jesuit provincials have not come out more clearly and proactively. I had to listen to a dribble from my own provincial who then begins to tell us at a community meeting that, you know, well, it's really just, you know, something that isn't at awful what the press is doing to us. And so that was something that was done by Cardinal Law in 2002. How in God's name, where have you been that you could utter such blasphemy in, the, in this day and age, quite frankly? And furthermore, so again, you know, here I'm trashing my boss, but anyway, you know, um, but where, where the heck is the leadership that's bold? You know, look at what you're doing, okay? So I want to urge Georgetown to go back to your intellectual tradition and commission a working group to put all of the Catholic universities together so that we do something in our tradition, which is an intellectual tradition, and I'm Irish and I'm a Jesuit, I don't get revenge, I don't get mad, I get even. Get even. So I can't even say it right, yeah. Right. <laughs> but that's okay. what Jack DeJoya needs to do. Wow. Uh, we have uh, time for about three more. Let's pull three questions together and then let's, of students. I see one student here, a couple back there, okay. And then there's a student here. Maybe we'll do more than three. Hi, my name is Madison Alvarez. I'm a student in Professor Carr's seminar. Uh, so following the revelations of Cardinal McCarrick's um, you know, deeds this past summer, our LGBTQ Resource Center on campus has received several messages blaming its staff for this crisis. And this is but one of many instances that I've seen of people blaming the LGBTQ community, specifically gay priests, for this crisis. So I sort of have a, a two-fold question. First, how do we account for the fact that survivors of clerical sexual abuse are disproportionately male? And what can we do to make sure that the LGBTQ community doesn't become a scapegoat in this crisis? Okay. You get extra credit for class participation. <laughs> uh, let's add a couple more here. Hi, my name is Kevin Perez. I'm a senior in the SFS. I'm originally from Guam, and I'm not sure if you're familiar with it, but for the past three, four years, the church in Guam has been reeling from its own sexual abuse scandal, and the narrative back home is focused on sort of victim um, recompense and the sins of the individual priests. It gives me a lot of hope hearing here that there's more discussion about long-term reform and structural changes, but one thing that I can't clear my conscience of 
is, um, as you've mentioned, the implicit role we've played as um, lay people in enabling um, the traditional church from allowing this to happen. So I guess my question now is, as lay people, how do we stand in solidarity with survivors in ensuring they get appropriate um, recompense in the short term, along with the structural changes we seek in the long term? Okay, and one more over here. My name is Forrest Gert, and I'm a junior in the SFS. Um, there are striking similarities between the efforts that some of the panelists have described um, back in 2002, the reporting that happened then, and um, even events like this, and what happened then. How do we actually mobilize as lay people to both keep, I don't know, real pressure on the current church hierarchy and, and make sure that we create lasting change? Okay, three questions. What about uh, the fact that most victims are young men or adolescent men? And what does that mean in terms of pressure on LBGTQ? And two questions about lay people. How do we not enable, and how do we keep pressure on? And I invite any of the panelists. Do you want to talk about who sure. and what? Yeah. Um, why do we see a disproportionate number of male-to-male -male offending? It's a very simple opportunity reality. There were no altar girls to the 1990s in the United States. So opportunity offending is simply they offend with whatever person is there, okay? So that's the reason for it. As your uh, panelist member, the lawyer Kevin, I think yeah. his name was said, for God's sake, and I'm quoting him, so, for God's sake, let's not confuse sex of, between two adults and sex between a perpetrator and a child, all right? There is no connection whatsoever. As a matter of fact, the data does not support that there was a higher percentage of homosexuals who offended. That's simply not true. You know, actually it's all the straight men and those who were confused, like you were saying, the unintegrated sexual identity that were the highest number of those who offended children, right? Let's be really clear about that. So what does that mean? You know, so the scapegoating issue, the second part of your question is, wouldn't it be nice if the bishops, wouldn't it be even better if academicians stood up with a common voice and said once and for all, the data does not support the scapegoating, stop it, period. And it does not support the scapegoating for this reason, because as soon as you equate the gay lifestyle or gay orientation with offending children, that's an old tactic, you know, and it puts people who need to integrate their sexuality, who want to believe, on the defensive. You know, so again, enough of the scapegoating, it has nothing to do with it. As a matter of fact, follow this logic. Yeah, let's get rid of all the gay priests, you know, because that will stop abuse. Well, actually then look at the data, doctor, because the majority of offenders in society are white, heterosexual, married, middle-class men. So let's get rid of them and we'll solve the problem. <laughs> Okay. It is what I call arrogant ignorance. Uh, enabling and empowering, uh, what's the role of the laity? I am, first of all, all three of those questions were so beautifully articulate and um, insightful. It, that gives me profound hope in your generation. Uh, your insight is right on target. There is a sense where we are all complicit in this. We have all been complicit to a certain degree in, in advancing the clerical culture. It's insidious, and we're, we're not even conscious of it. So you're very brave to, to say what you said. Naming it and having discussions like this is a first very important step. And I think it was Forrest who spoke about what can we do. Everywhere I go, I ask older people, what is different about now? What is different about 2018 as opposed to 2002 and earlier years? And I'm, I'm trying to answer that question. One thing is there's a cumulative effect of collective outrage. Mm -hmm. um, a, a second is a your generation demanding that we be accountable and unified and we act now. You want it now. I mean, this was brought up. 
Um, and then I also think that the culture around us has changed. The Me Too movement is a positive motivating force for us in affecting change now. And, and in 2002, I had to go bishop by bishop, chancery by chancery, essentially making the case, you can trust us. This is not a lay, hostile takeover of the church. This is exercising our baptismal rights and responsibilities. Now, I don't have to persuade them. They we're credible, they know that they need us, and that's uh, another factor that we have collectively in our favor. Well, I'm less optimistic, Carrie. Um, <laughs> and I think what's, hap what's different between then and now is they promised to do better. We all knew what happened, we had the numbers, and they failed us, they didn't. They absolutely, almost every diocese kept secret files, and those are the files we haven't gotten yet. They promised to do better, and they haven't. So I can't trust them to do better on this. But in terms of lay leadership, you, everybody, um, we're victims. As, as Roman Catholics in the Catholic Church, people in the pews are victims too. They took advantage of us. They took advantage of our trust, our love for our faith, and who we are, and our money. Um, and they wasted it uh, on, on whatever they were doing. But we can't let them do that anymore. We have to take our church back and tell them, stand up here and tell us the truth. Did you transfer priest? Did you not? And what are you going to do about it? And this is what we're going to do in our church. We're going to every meeting. We're going to make sure that the finance council has women and young people on it. Um, and we're going to participate whether they want us there or not. We have to make them do it. I don't see us getting into the culture and sitting back anymore unless we stand straight to them and force them. And uh, I, I, I don't think there's much difference between then and now, except that the trust is even more eroded because they promised they would do better. And all those recommendations that we gave them 24 uh, to do between now and to then and now, they haven't done. They didn't even look at them. Mm -hmm. And just, just to follow up, if I may, Judge, I think what you're also asking, if I'm hearing you correctly, is how do we not you know, continue to come back here yet again? And I think one of the things would be to have executive organizational evaluations uh, while the bishop is being vetted, but also that there has to be a yearly, you know, just like any CEO has a yearly evaluation audit. and audit and about audit. how well did you do or how well didn't you do. Yeah. Not, an, an audit on how they, they deal with things. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, Carrie said her uh, sign of hope are young people. You, you represent all young people on this panel. <laughs> so no pressure. We're, we're looking for you for a closing sign of hope. Gosh, um, I think mean, obviously it's very difficult to find hope in times like this. I know a number of us came here and we're hoping for transformation and healing. Um, I think it's perfectly normal and probably good to walk out without that. Um, something I've heard from a lot of Catholics, especially young Catholics, is how angry they are about this, how betrayed they feel by their church, how saddened they are that this has happened to people. Um, but anger is something that keeps coming up an awful lot. Um, I think as humans, especially as Catholics, um, we're always taught to think, you know, anger is a bad thing. That's a scary word. It's a negative emotion. We don't want to, we don't want to deal with that. We want to minimize it. Um, I'm going to argue that anger isn't actually a bad thing. Jesus himself was fully human and fully divine. Jesus got angry. We say that in the Gospels, in the cleansing of the temple, where he clears out the money lenders and the merchants. It's in every single Gospel, the synoptics and John. Um, Jesus himself got angry when he saw what people were doing to his father's house. I don't think it's wrong to follow his example and to demand change. And wow. people are here demanding it. Took us the whole meeting to get to Jesus, but uh, <laughs> I, th I think we're going back to him momentarily as we pray. Uh, uh, somebody asked what else can be done. Let me run through some things that are going to happen. On November 4th, here in Dahlgren at 6 p.m., there's going to be a session with Father Jerry, 
as you can see, he's very mild mannered, restrained, <laughs> uh, no opinions. No. Uh, it ought to be an interesting dialogue. <laughs> On November 19th, here in Dahlgren at 5 p.m., uh, there will be a liturgy of music and prayer for repentance in a time of crisis. Just a couple things that are coming up. We're meeting with the law school about the way the law has helped uncover this and has contributed to that, and we'll be working together. Our initiative does an annual convening. Uh, Carrie has been a part of it. Father Mark has been a part of it. Our convening at the end of this academic year where we bring leaders from all across the country for three days is going to be about lay leadership in a broken church and a divided nation. And we think, frankly, after a year of this, we can focus on some specifics. Our initiative actually does things that don't involve sex or sex abuse. On uh, November 19th, uh, we have a session on faith and the faithful in the 2018 elections. As you can see, the country is doing really well while the church is doing really badly. Uh, we thought we'd cover that. And then on December 6th, uh, we are doing a session on the lessons from our polarization conference uh, on how the divisions in our church undercut our public witness. And they're also being weaponized in this struggle over clerical sexual abuse to attack Pope Francis and others. I want to thank Father Mark, uh, John, uh, Jim Winkler, our colleagues at Mission and Ministry. I want to thank Kim Daniels, Anna Misla. Where's Anna? Uh, Anna is, this is her first dialogue, and it went pretty well. You can stay. Uh, <laughs> I want to thank you, and I want you to join me in thanking this remarkable panel. Just one minute. I want to uh, close with just a personal word. Several times people here have said, uh, we're more than the bishops, we're more than the hierarchy, I would like to also say as a community of faith, we're more than our failures. And we have talked a lot about our failures tonight and they haunt us in lots of different ways. But we are not only our failures. If you think about this community of faith, Anne, Anne said she would never leave. I'm not leaving either. But if you think about this community of faith tonight, there are 1,400 people in Washington who find a place out of the wind and out of the cold because of our church. Tomorrow there are 25,000 young people who will get a good education, a lot of them in inner city schools because of our community of faith. This week in a hundred of the poorest places on earth, Catholic Relief Services, Jesuit Refugee Services and others, missionaries are lifting up, proclaiming the gospel, defending human dignity. And on this hilltop, on, the, on Capitol Hill, this church unites to defend the unborn and the undocumented and the hungry and the homeless and make the case for human life and dignity. And on this hilltop, the oldest Jesuit university is bringing together faith and reason, service and worship to try and form a new generation of people for others who can make a difference on this problem and many other problems. So now as we turn to pray and to sing, and we need both, let us remember we're more than our failures. We have a gospel to preach, we have the least of these to serve, and we have new generations to educate. Thank you very much. As is our custom for the dialogues, we started in prayer and we will now end with prayer. And so we'll have some petitions, a closing prayer. And then on the back of your, uh, your uh, program, there will be a, a song for us to sing, for as Augustine says, to sing to God is to twice pray to God. Um, at the end of this uh, prayer service, uh, then there will be a reception uh, upstairs in the um, uh, third floor president's room. I think that's what it's called. I'm still kind of new here. I think it's called the president's room. <laughs> Please stand.
As we close our time together, let us bring our needs and the needs of others before the Lord. Please respond, Lord, have mercy. For those who have been wounded by clergy, who use their position and privilege to victimize others, that these survivors may find justice and healing, we pray. Lord, have mercy. For the faithful who have been betrayed by those entrusted with their care and protection, that we may find willingness to develop systems and practices to restore trust in the leadership of the church, we pray. Lord, have mercy. For the light of truth to shine into darkness and sin, so that justice and healing may begin for all, we pray. Lord, have mercy. For the church, that in the open confrontation of shameful incidents from the past, the church may become a sanctuary of truth and place of safety and justice for those who find themselves victimized and abused by others. We pray. Lord. Let us pray. God of endless love, ever caring, ever strong, always present, always just. You gave your only son to save us by the blood of the cross. Gentle Jesus, shepherd of peace, join to your own suffering the pain of all who have been hurt in body, mind, and spirit by those who betrayed the trust placed in them. Hear our cries as we agonize over the harm done to our brothers and sisters. Breathe wisdom into our prayers Soothe restless hearts with hope. Steady shaken spirits with faith. Show us the way to justice and wholeness, enlightened by truth and enfolded in your mercy. Holy Spirit, comforter of hearts, heal your people's wounds and transform our brokenness. Grant us courage and wisdom, humility and grace, so that we may act with justice and find peace in you. We ask this through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen.